$14 to do it. It's that good. Thank you so much to those that have put that into place for us. But today, we want to go back and to dig into some of the words that Jesus gave to us as we move forward and understand what it means to talk to him and the way that he would have us to talk to him. So it begins this way. When Jesus says when we talk to our Father in heaven, that we understand that he's a good, good father. There's a song that we sing uh, quite often. You're a good, good father. That, that's who you are. That's who you are. And, and I'm loved by you. That's, that's who I am. That's who I am. You're a good, good father. Uh, turn to somebody and say, he's a good, good father. Now, as, as we think about that, it's passionately important that we all understand this. Many of us have had really good earthly fathers. And thank God for those fathers. Others have had fathers who were abusive or weren't there. As I think about my own life and I look back on my life with my children, I hope that they're going to be able to say he was a good, good father. I, I certainly know that I tried. And a lot of times if you're a father out there, you're going like, hey, man, I'm giving it my best shot. and I'm, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. Some days I'm good and sometimes I'm not. And, but ultimately, God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the good, good father. All right, just, don't, just get a picture in your mind right now of what the perfect father would be like if you could see the perfect father on earth. He'd be, he'd be loving and firm. He'd be kind. He'd be gracious. He'd be somebody that instructs us in the way that we're to go. And he would also help us to kind of give us a punch in the arm when we needed a punch in the arm or some, an arm around the shoulder when we needed an arm around the shoulder. And sometimes God is that God who will give us a, a kick in the derriere when we need a kick in the derriere when we need one, right? So he's a good Good father. Let me ask you this. How many of you need God to put his arm around you? Raise your hand. How many of you sometimes need God to kind of give you a punch in the arm saying, hey, you can do this, right? Now, let me, this is really authentic here. How, here, are you with me now? How, how many of you sometimes know God needs to kick you in the derriere, right? Okay, good, good. So we understand a good, good father sometimes is, is about truth. And he's sometimes about grace. He's about righteousness and he's about love. But a good, good father is there to put you in his arms to hug him, to hug you rather, even after he disciplines you. God is that way. And here is how God wants us to talk to him. First of all, he says, don't make a show when you pray. It's about your heart. Just as Justin talked to us about the love of God and how we should love one another of the opposite sex in a marital relationship and how that's to be very genuine, it's from the heart. And then Brad talked to us last week about how when we, we give our time and our talents and our treasures, ultimately it needs to come from the heart, not because we got to, but because we get to. And, and this week we, we learn what Jesus wants us to do. And ultimately Jesus was God in the flesh on this earth. And he's talking to us about how he talks with his father in the, the relationship of the Trinity. Incidentally, this relationship has been since the beginning of time. In the, the very first book of, of the Bible, in the very first chapter, it says, let us make humankind in our own image. That's not the image of God and some angels. That's in the image of God, the father, God, the son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Not enough time to talk about how that relationship works. I do encourage you, though, because I like media, and sometimes media takes us to places where we can understand better, um, to go find a movie on your streaming platform called The Shack. It's called The Shack. You know some Shack fans here? Yep, this gives a whole new meaning to shacking up in a good way. Um, shack up with God, not with somebody else. That's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. <laughs> Oh, you know, you know, hypocrites, they're people that are not themselves on Sunday. <laughs> For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, Jesus says, I say to you, they have received their reward. In another translation, it says, they have received their reward in full. Do, do you know people that pray pompous prayers or do things in, in a pompous way? And, and basically, you, you leave impressed by what they said to you. No, you don't feel impressed. God's not impressed either. It's like an Indian one time was challenged, uh, American Indian, and we certainly did not treat American Indians well, any of those of you of, any, of that extraction. He said to one of his braves, he said, why are you so nice to the, the white man? He said, because I have a deeper peace in my life. He said, but... But how do you listen to what it is that he has to say? He says, he is like a big cloud, much thunder, no rain. 
kind of like it's been here, right, in the last week. A lot of those happening. Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites. And when you do, keep it simple. Keep your prayer simple. Here's the next thing. Have a one-on-one with God to receive the reward that he has for you. Here's what Jesus says. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, I know people that have a prayer room in their their house. For some of you, that secret room is a place where you kneel by your bed. For some of you, it's when you lay your head on the pillow at night and you're preparing to go to sleep. For for others of you, you you talk to God while you're in your car. What's interesting these days is that we can talk out loud to ourselves in public and people don't think that we need to be sent to insane asylum anymore, right? (laughs) I was running at Stowe White the other day around the gym floor, and this guy who had earbuds in his ear, and he's over there just kind of talking to somebody. I don't know who he was talking to, but, but God wants us to do it in secret before we go public. Now, thank God for people like Brian and our elders who speak very simply to God and, and use simple words to him, but, but I can promise you that the heart that prays on your behalf, on behalf of our, our, our church as a body, also pray in secret in just the same way and in simplicity. Here's the next thing. Keep it simple and conversational. And when you pray, Jesus said, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever heard people pray and there's a bunch of empty phrases, right? If you're praying that way, why don't you treat your family better? If you're using big words like that, why don't you honor God with your first and best knowing he'll take care of the rest? Lots of empty phrases like the Gentiles do. When you see the word Gentiles in the Bible, think outsiders. As a matter of fact, let me teach you here. Let's always, we, maybe we can associate something here now and forever. Gentiles equals outsiders. Everybody say Gentiles, Gentiles. equals outsiders. The insiders that Jesus was talking to were people that were the Jewish faith. God, first of all, offered the faith of Jesus to the Jewish people and then ultimately to outsiders as well. But, but outsiders tend to pray with lots of words. They, they use big fancy words. Have you ever watched like a presidential inauguration or um, somebody that's on television that's praying or whatever and you're going like, would you you kind of get to the part? (laughs) And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles or outsiders do. Gentiles means what? Good. Gentiles means what? Good. So when you read the Bible, you always know that's what Jesus is talking about. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Okay, so why are we supposed to ask Him? Because you have communications with those that you love, don't you? You don't remain silent, right? How many of you sit next to somebody you love? All right. Now, if you didn't come with them, don't be doing some weird stuff, all right? <laughs> What if on the day after the wedding, one of the newly married couple turns to the other and starts to have a conversation and the other one does not respond? Some of y'all going like, that's exactly what happened in the morning. (laughs) (laughs) Would you think that person loved you? You know, you talk to the people that you love. You have conversations with the people you love. Good conversations, bad conversations. Easy conversations, hard conversations. You you talk to people you love. You don't just stonewall. By the way, the greatest place where men tend to retreat, I'm going to be misogynistic here a little bit in in a good way. You women will be glad for it. (laughs) Is they go back into their cave and they get quiet, don't they? Mm -hmm. Now, some of you men out there, well, my wife does the same thing. Okay, I I get it. (laughs) But but the point is we talk to people we love. That's why. And here's what God also does. He redirects our hearts when we begin to ask him for things. Just like when I was a child, I've asked for too many cookies. It was going to spoil my appetite. If I asked for too much money, God knows it's going to spoil my attitude and my character. He won't give it to me. He puts us on the same page as we talk to him. Have you ever done that? You've asked God for... See, I've, I've, I've been in this prayer with God for years and I get about halfway through it and he kind of goes, nah, I ain't ready for that. Just one million, God. I just need one million. That's all I need. I don't need 737 million or however much the Powerball is right now. 
Uh, incidentally, it, it, any of y'all bought a ticket out there? Nobody's raising their hand. So. <laughs> I bought them before. Okay, good, good. So, so if you win and the rest of you that didn't raise your hands, I hope you will tithe and you've learned to do that. So <laughs> put that to work. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Keep it simple. Have you ever been to that place where somebody's offering a public prayer? It's Thanksgiving, and by the time they're through, there's like this film on the gravy that's gotten real hard. I'm talking about. And or you know somebody's getting ready to pray, and Uncle Harry's gonna pray, and that means, oh Lord, can we play tic-tac-toe while he does this too? Because he's gonna talk about it forever. You know, you know people like that? Yeah. Jesus says, keep it simple. Incidentally, I would say this as well because there's a point to be made about this heaping up empty phrases. You, you know who heaps up empty phrases? The evil one does. The father of lies. He talks like this. No, don't eat. Don't worry about eating fruit of that tree because God knows you're going to be as smart as he is. We're not supposed to eat it. No, God understands you're going to. That's the evil one. He talks in that way. And in the lies we live... In a great book by John Mark Comer I've been reading the last 24 hours. It's from the father of lies. And he usually is a God of many words. And by a God, I put lowercase g. He's not the God. He is a pretender. There's a scripture in 1 Peter that says, Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's like a lion. But we worship the lion of the tribe of Judah. We worship the God of this universe. And here's the deal. I, I want to just take a poll here. When God speaks to you, does he speak to you like in long paragraphs? If, if he does, just raise your hand. I, I, I want to talk to you. Usually God speaks very simply. Yeah. He'll say yes, yes, no, maybe, wait, hang in there. How many of you have heard God speak that way? Ah, uh, yeah. God tends to speak that way. The devil, the evil one, speaks with many words. And he gives all kinds of lies to you. That's why you need to learn to listen for the Father's voice. And the only way you learn to listen to the Father's voice is you, you read what he says. And you say, God, please help me to understand this and apply this to my life. Because the evil one's going to come to you. Oh, man, it's okay. You can do this just one time. You're out of town and she's never going to know or he's never going to know. Or, hey, listen, it's just one drink. You're under a lot of stress. Just take one. As a matter of fact, take another one. As a matter of fact, take another one. Because you need it. You deserve it. Hey, listen, they should be paying you more at that company you work for anyway. It's fine for you to cook the books. Don't worry about it. Keep going. Or, no, this, this patient's somebody else's job. Somebody else should have done a better job with this. By the way, their breast stinks. I don't want to go in the same room with them. And you don't need to do that. That's what the evil one does. He talks with many words. He runs his mouth when God says, yes, no, go, stay, maybe in simplicity. Learn to listen to that voice. And I would say ultimately, and we're going to get to this in just a few moments. The ultimate thing he says to all of us is forgive. Address God in this way. First of all, talk to God in this way. Here's what Jesus said. <laughs> Here's how to talk to my father. Address him as the father and the only. I address him as father and only. Jonathan was typing this in, getting the notes ready for this week. He said, what do you mean by only? He's only. He's hallowed. He's separate. He's holy. He's the only one. He, he is separate and he is only. When, when Jesus says, hallowed be your name, he's not talking about Halloween. He's talking about how separate he is, how good he is, and how holy he is. Dear Dad, and notice the way Jesus begins his prayer. He doesn't begin his prayer with, hey, I need help with this. He goes, Dear Dad, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Second, ask him to bring what's up there, down here, through us. Your kingdom come. Your, say it with me, will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
It is already happening in heaven. And when Jesus comes to take over the throne of our lives, when we surrender our lives, we do not want to follow the father of lies anymore, but surrender to the father who sent the son to be the savior of the world. And the spirit comes to fill you and me. Here's what happens, church. Here's what happens. That goodness in God, as we stay plugged in and tuned in with him, his love and his joy and his peace and his patience and his goodness and kindness and gentleness and meekness and self-control, his love and his truth, his grace and his righteousness flows through us in the express lane driving to work when people are throwing the finger up at us when we when we look down at our wallet or we look at our bank accounts and what are we going to do with that goodness and mercy and love and truth and righteousness and all of God should flow through our lives when we open our mouths to the people that serve us. Incidentally, don't tell people, God bless you this Sunday afternoon that serve you at Longhorn or Sammy's or wherever you go unless you leave them a big tip. Don't be a cheap Christian. I got some good news for you. Not much of a tip. Buy low, sell high. <laughs> Say this with me. Your kingdom come. Say it with me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's really important to hang on to that thought because Jesus is going to get back to it. Then ask for what we need one day at a time. Give us today our daily bread. Give us what we need for today. Now, certainly this means that cinnamon crunch bagel from Panera Bread or that Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich that's just delightful, or the salmon at the lodge with the vegetables, or the ever-present wonderful Zaxby's chicken salad. Although since they've reopened in Gastonia, somebody has made their chicken smaller, and they need to give us a little bit more of that. <laughs> He's also saying, give me wisdom for today. Give me some of this bread in this mind translated into this heart and these hands and these feet and my actions. Give me what I need today so that I can do what it is you need me to do today. I got a tough conversation to have with somebody today. I don't want to have it, but I got to have it. I've got this tough job to do. I've got this thing I've got to do at work and I'm not smart enough to do it. I don't have all the facts. Please help me to find what it is I need to do what the boss says for me to do. Or if you're a teacher in the classroom, how many teachers do we have? in the room. You have a teacher. It's fantastic. Thank God for you teachers. More about you later. Um, but you got kids in your class that 10 of them are on medicine and five of them don't take it. <laughs> oh, you heard that, didn't you? All right. Dear God, help me with this tough kid. And then he says, Ask him to forgive us as we forgive. Give us what we need for today. It's interesting, before I get on to forgiveness, that when Jesus is walking down to the road with, with his disciples, and this one particular passage, Jesus says to the guys, hey, sufficient unto the day is the trouble thereof. That's the King James Version for, hey, take it one day at a time, Peter. Hey, take it one, time, one day at a time, James. Hey, take it one, time, one day at a time. John, you can't live more than today. Now, now you need to plan for tomorrow. And those of you that are, are making financial decisions, you need to come back next week. We're going to talk about money. I guess we'll clear out the auditorium next week. I don't know, but Jesus talks a lot about it. You, you do need to plan and prepare, but ultimately, with your daily bread and your daily car payments and your daily house payments and your daily coals payments and all those kinds of things, trust Him for today with those things you're paying for, plan for tomorrow, but ultimately, so many of us heap yesterday's bitternesses on top of today's things that are happening and concerns and burying them in tomorrow's fears and wondering why we can't live. Jesus kind of goes, hey, one day at a time. Sometimes one hour at a time. Enough said, another day. Ask him to forgive. As we forgive, ask you a question. There's money in your life that's hard to forgive. If you had a bad, bad father, that's who he was, 
who he is, who he is. He had a bitter mother. Somebody said years ago that you can understand when you're mature is when you can forgive your parents. You've got a child that's gone astray and they're not listening to anything you say. They're not communicating with you. They're off in their own far country. They're doing their own thing. They need your forgiveness. I think it's fascinating that this prayer ends with forgiveness, both here and in the Gospel of Luke. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do you notice the tense there? Here's what Jesus is saying to us, and he's going to reiterate it in just a moment. Don't come to me with your prayers unless you've first given, forgiven the people that you need to forgive. Otherwise, you are flapping your jaws and you are wasting your time. You ever notice that? You prayed this and it feels like hitting a ceiling between you and heaven? Because it's got the beginning in the context of forgiveness. And then that we follow the example of Jesus and more about that in just a few moments. Ask him then to give us tests that we can only pass with his help. Here's the deal. All of us have tests every day. Wouldn't it be nice if you woke up in the morning and everything was perfect and you hit every green light on the way to work and you got to work and you understand you, you got a promotion and a raise in the same day and they're going to give you another one tomorrow and you came home and your children had picked up their dirty shoes and made up their bed and had prepared a wonderful cake to, for you as mother or father just because you're such a wonderful person. Have you ever had days like that? Yeah, but they're few and far between. Here's the, because life is filled with tests. And each day as we, we come into tests, we have to say, dear God, please give us the energy, the wisdom, the power, the daily bread so that we can pass these tests. I, I, I can't do it without you. So it's, it's okay. Jesus said this. Ask God only for tests that you can pass with his help. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. When he says, lead us not to temptation, it's not the best translation. It's lead us not to the test that we can't pass without him. And then secondly, as part of that prayer, ask him to prompt us to do whatever is necessary to stay away from evil. Hey, when the devil starts, hey, man, come on over here. You can take a bite. You can do this just one time. And you kind of go, well, okay, that's kind of looking interesting. All right, I'm, I'm getting that. Now, you, you run away. Don't start talking to the devil or with him. Instead, listen to the Father and say, please deliver me from evil. You say, I'm surrounded by evil all the time. Hey, you don't need to get up out of your seat to confront evil. There's some of you right now sitting there going like, man, I wish this was over with. I'm ready to go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Well, hang on, there's going to be some there for you when you get there. That's the devil. He's going, come on, he just runs his mouth too much. He doesn't ever know when to shut up. No, 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 no. Yeah, I do. It's, we'll be through in about 10 minutes. It's okay. <laughs> kind of like a Chinese restaurant. Be 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went there. I just did. <laughs> Deliver us from evil. And that relates to evil thought patterns. You don't need that to keep that marriage vow. She should be treating you better than that. He should be treating you better than that. It's only one time. That's his, that's his voice. That's the liar's voice. Your kids are never going to be okay. They're never going to come back. They're always going to be a mess. That's a liar. That's his voice. Don't listen to it. Don't give in to it. You're just a loser, capital L, right here on your head. You always have been. You always will be. That's a liar. That is not what God has to say about you. Do not listen to that evil voice. Deliver us from evil. And then he goes back to the forgiveness thing. Help us to forgive so that our prayers will be effective. But before he does that in some translations, and for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The earliest manuscripts didn't have that in it, so some Bible translations don't have it, but the truth of that is as true as yesterday. For his is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And because of that, help us to forgive as you forgive so that our prayers might be effective. Listen, he, he goes at the bottom line. 
by the way, let, let's do this. Let's pray the Our Father together. Ready? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In both Matthew's account and Luke's account, though, in the best manuscripts, it ends this way. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Who in your life do you need to forgive? Someone put it this way, bitterness is taking poison and drinking it and hoping the other person you're bitter against will die. It's killing you. And some of you have hard things to forgive. Abuses that are untold. But Jesus is saying we need to begin and bathe everything that we have that we say to him in forgiveness. And then do not put on the show when you do without. <laughs> Again, it's about your heart. Are there times in your life Jesus moves in now to a thing called fasting? Are there, are there times in your life where you've decided to fast? Now, typically, when we think about fasting, fasting has to do with what? Substance. Do so you say that? It's a food, right? But it also could be media. It also could be uh, from doing a certain kind of habit that you've done. You, you take the initiative to say, I'm not going to do that so I can draw closer to God. And, and here's my definition of fasting. I, I didn't look up one. I just kind of came up with one on my own. Doing without so that God will do something within you for the right reason in the right way. So if you're doing without food, what you're doing is kind of saying, every time I get hungry, I'm going to be drawn back to God, the one that's given me my daily bread, not just in terms of food, but also knowledge and wisdom and understanding and applying it to my life. But ultimately, that's what fasting is all about. Why, well, let me ask you this question. How many of you have heard of this thing called intermittent fasting? It's the new thing, right? Where you don't eat anything after 9 o'clock at night or 6 o'clock at night until the next day at noon and... You try, there's all kinds of different ways. There's like 14-hour versions and 16-hour versions, 18-hour versions. I see y'all smiling out there. You've heard of Some of y'all are doing this, aren't you? <laughs> but Jesus has a way. He says if you're fasting, first of all, do it for the right reasons, to draw closer to him. He says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, they have received their reward. So you know the truth, don't you? Let's hope it's not you. How are you doing today? Awful. I haven't eaten anything since 6 o'clock last night. And all I get to have now is black coffee. Get me some. <laughs> you want to talk about it, don't you? Some of y'all turn it. Yes, yes, you did that yesterday. <laughs> Intermittent fasting, you did it right. He said, no, when you do without, do it for the right reasons so God can show you the right reason. By the way, look, Stacy, people that are pregnant, don't be fasting and babies need to eat, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Truly I say to you, they've received their reward. That means that the dude or the lady that comes on, here, no, he says, but when you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your father who's in secret. He's like, nobody else needs to know this except you. You run to people that, that don't have their make on, makeup on at work. What are you doing? I'm fasting. <laughs> Even for putting makeup on. Okay, okay, all right. Why does your hair stink? Because I didn't wash it. <laughs> now put the head and shoulders on there and then put some conditioner, some trace of may or whatever you use or herbal essence or something to make it better. He's saying, don't let anybody know. And here's what he says. But by your father who sees in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So God wants to reward us. <laughs> he wants to reward us with what is right for us. Your father wants to give you what you want, what you really want, and what really will be best for you. 
He has your best interest at heart. Do you see that? But here's what the devil will go. Now you need to put on when you're doing fast. You need to show people. You need to go, oh, it's all the bad. Yes, I smell bad. My deodorant was not going to get on me today because I'm fasting. God wants to reward you. And see, fasting is a way to draw close to him. That's why Jesus has connected it with communicating with him in the Lord's Prayer. But we continue. So how did Jesus pray? <laughs> so what we're doing this summer is we're talking about the principles of the Sermon on the Mount, but going to excavate through Scripture examples of how Jesus lives out what he tells us to pray. And so here's how Jesus prays. I'm going to teach you four words that will help you to pray for the rest of your life. You don't even need to know all that our Father, although you should, but these are the four general categories. Here's the first one. Wow. Everybody say wow. wow. Jesus doesn't begin with prayer. Dear God, I need your help. Dear Daddy, they're messing up again. <laughs> or in a British accent. Oh, Father, they're messing up again. They're making my life miserable. You notice on the screen, Jesus always has a British accent. I don't know. There's something about that. Here's the first example. Wow, it's amazing you keep it so simple. There's this context in Matthew chapter 11 where there's a bunch of super wise people that are pretending to be so very understanding, but only the children are getting what Jesus is saying. And here's what Jesus does. He calls out the Father. He says, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and the understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such is your gracious will. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's going, wow, Dad, you are so smart. You make it simple. So the first prayer we pray is wow. Everybody say wow. wow. Here's the second prayer we pray. Thanks. 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 Now, now, we get them out of order, don't we? Most of us, again, I'm having a problem over here, Lord. He's sleeping right next to me. Thank you for always hearing me, Jesus. In his example, praise this for us. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, there's a story we talked about at length last year, and there's a place where Jesus actually brings a guy who's been dead for three days back to life. And, and right before he gives him the power to be risen from the dead, he says something out loud to the Father in front of a bunch of people. And notice his words are not complicated. They're very simple. So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. Sometimes you need to call it out when God's about to do something in your life in front of somebody else. It's okay. But notice Jesus was very simple. He didn't go magnificent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, magnificated God. He doesn't use any Harvard words. He keeps it simple. So a Scottish pastor invited one of his elders to pray like Brian prayed for us this morning. The guy got up there and he started it. Magnificent Heavenly Father, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, magnificent, wonderful, omniscient, omnipresent. After about two minutes of this, the pastor said, Call him father and ask him for something. <laughs> and thirdly, Jesus said to pray, help. Everybody say help. help. See, y'all are good at that. I didn't have to coach you at all. Everybody, help. You practiced this before, haven't you? But let's go back and review. Say, wow, first. Wow. Say, thanks. thanks. And help. help. God invites us to ask for his help. God even invites us to ask for things that are not his will so that he will show us what his will is. Okay. You know, Jesus did that. It comes his time in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night before he's betrayed, on the night before he's beaten. And it's, by the way, I've been there a couple of times. It's not an impressive place. It's like the woods back behind your house. Gnarly old tree. He goes to this place and he comes to this place and he, he kneels, he starts to pray and and going a little further, he fell on his face because he was about to be crucified. And he was going to ask God, I don't want to have to go through this. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Do you know Jesus was asking for God to do something that wasn't God's will for him? It's okay for you to ask. But he knew God put a lid on it. But he was going to ask again. He says it again. 
Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, you will be done. Jesus said that. God on this earth said that. It's okay for you and me to pray to win the lottery, but don't be surprised if you don't because you can't handle it. And God knows it. So Jesus prayed for help. But here's the last thing. Forgive. Forgive them. It's the next day. And it's been the hellish 24 hours for Jesus. He's been beaten with cords and shrapnel and his back has opened up and he's been pierced with both his hands so that you and I might be made right with God because he's made the sin penalty and his feet are pierced with a spike. And in the last moments of his life before he gives up his life on this earth, he looks down and the soldiers are gambling for his clothes. They're going to sell it on Facebook Marketplace or eBay. Oh, Lord, I hear rain. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. It's like it stopped. Maybe he did that for dramatic effect. <laughs> I promise it was not planned. We don't have somebody up on the roof going. <laughs> oh boy. I had a friend of mine, this youth pastor, years ago when Jaws came out. He had this big, we rented this big pool for everybody to float and watch the movie Jaws. And he had visions of coming up under them under the water going, dun, 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 dun. He never did. It has nothing to do with the message. Here's what he says when they're gambling for his clothes. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. The spouse who's saying they don't need you anymore, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. But the child that's run away, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. They're not even run away out of the house. They just run away from here, and they're over in the corner, and they don't want anybody messing with them. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. You see... The prayers of Jesus end with forgiveness. And it's always in the context of forgiveness. So what? So pray as God would have us to pray, beginning with our Father and ending with forgive. That's how God wants us to pray. But in order for us to do that, we have to be able to call him our Father. So today I want to invite you to bow your heads and hearts in prayer. And I want to invite you to accept Jesus into your life and your heart and to make him first and only. Today, if you're within the sound of my voice, we thank those of you that are present here physically and those that are watching you online. You're with us as well, and we love you. And There's somebody, somebody's out there today who have never said yes to Jesus, but the good, good Father sent the Son to be your Savior. How do you come to terms with this? How do you get back on right terms with God? You accept what Jesus has done for you. I invite you, if you want to turn your life over to God, to make that decision right now. And say, dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay my penalty. I'm following you now. Dear Heavenly Father, please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for sending Jesus to pay my penalty. I'm following you now.